Hello, today we're going to be going through a tutorial for creating an Apollo federated graph using federated graph QL and specifically using Apollo Federation. So this tutorial is on Medium and it's by this person, but we won't be going through all three steps. So we are only, only going to be going through the very first step, which is building a simple GraphQL federated schema. The other two steps are mainly for fetching data from like REST API sources and deploying the thing we create onto AWS. So the focus of this video will just be part one. All right, so we've already seen what Apollo Federation is and Apollo Federation in the previous video, just to recap, is a way to implement a federated graph and it takes care of composing these schemas from different services together. All right, so let's look at what we'll be building. We'll be building a simple application that displays a user's personal cryptocurrency wallet holdings and balance along with user data and currency information. So user service, let's get started by building these services as they'll need to be up and running in order for our gateway to discover them. Right, so we're going to first begin by cloning the starter project. So you just copy that and paste it into wherever you want to paste it. So in I'm putting it in the federated graph directory. So we have this. And just looking at the starter project, let's see what we have. So we seem to have three services. So these three services based off of this diagram are going to be our subgraphs or microservices. And there's a user service, wallet service and crypto service. So those are the three services and looking into each of these services, there's a dot babel RC file and we have an index file and the package JSON with some dependencies. The user API also has a very similar setup and I'm guessing the wallet API is exactly the same thing as well. And it is. Okay. This is fine. Let's look at this Babel config. So this is the Babel config. There's plugins and presets. There's a gateway, a license, and a package JSON. So this also has some dependencies and you could think about it as like this just being the services and then this being our gateway code. And there are dependencies here as well that we'll be installing shortly. Okay, there's also a readme. So this is our starting code. We've got that done. Next, we're going to CD into that specific directory. So it's CD Apollo Federation Starter. And then we're going to open the services slash user API directory and install dependencies. CD into user, so services, user, API, and then npm install. So let that install the dependencies specified under this package JSON. So we see the node modules come up there. Then we have to run this once that's installed. And this is just going to install the Apollo Server and Apollo Federation libraries. Okay, so let's install that. While that's installing, let's read the rest of this. So then we open the user API index file in your editor. 
which will be used as the entry point into the service and add the following server definition. So if I go to the index file, which is here. So this is going to be the index file for my user API microservice. This might as well just be on a separate, um, it may, may just be owned by a separate team. So these are just microservices. So let's look at what the index file looks like. So just taking a quick glance of this, this is just starting up the server, but let's go through it a little bit more. So this is just importing GQL and Apollo server from Apollo server. So this is done in a normal GraphQL setup. This is not an Apollo Federation thing. This is just using Apollo GraphQL. All right, then we have the build federated schema. So this is an Apollo Federation thing. And we then also import resolvers from a resolvers file and type that from a dot schema file. So we'll look at this shortly once we create it. We set the port number. So I think the reason we're setting the port number over here is so that the ports are different for each of the services. So that we're kind of mimicking the fact that there are separate microservices on different ports. Next, we're going to initialize an Apollo server instance. Define the schema and resolvers for the federated service. All right, so we have the server which is just using the same new Apollo server command that's using Apollo so that's using Apollo GraphQL and not necessarily Apollo Federation so it's using that same command and this is just the server config that's being passed in so if you go back to the documentation you'll see a schema field and they've just used the build federated schema and passed in type depths and resolvers. So this is just generic code that you write out if you're creating a Apollo Federation API. Next, we start the server. So again, this is very generic and this is something you would do in Apollo GraphQL as well. So the main difference here is just this build federated schema to be very honest and the fact that you're setting a port number but this is the main difference. So the build federated schema between Apollo Federation and just the normal Apollo GraphQL setup. All right, next we'll define our user schema by first creating the following folder and file in the root of the user API directory. So this is just gonna make a schema directory CD into it. Oh, okay, also we have a high vulnerability. So I'm gonna fast forward this video and fix the issue by installing a couple of things as suggested by NPM audit. Okay, so our next step is to define our user schema by creating the following folder file in the root of the user API directory. So this step is just making us create the schema file and it's going to be blank right now so we're going to make a schema directory and create an index file inside that so this is what's been created next we open this file and add the following schema definition so let's look at this so this uses gql and again this is the same sort of syntax that's used in normal GraphQL. All right, so what's similar is the fact that we're exporting these type defs. What's different is the fact that we now have entities because we have the at key directive. So let's look into this. So let's look at the comment properly. The user type definition as an entity to be shared with multiple services. The at key directive defines the entity's primary key. This primary key will be used as a unique reference for all implementing services. So this means that user will be, a so other services will be able to access this user entity because we've defined the user type to be an entity using the at key directive and the field is going to be wallet ID. So that's the primary key. Okay, so we have the user type with these three fields and then we have a query. 
So this is what we usually have in GraphQL. So when you query for user and you specify the user ID, it'll return a user. So these are our types for the index file in this microservice, so in the user API. Now that we have our schema for our data structure, we'll define the data to be returned by creating some example user data. From the root of the user API directory, type the following. So we go to the root of the user API directory. Oh, oops. So let me cd into, let me save this and save this, cd up a level. And let's go to user API. All right, uh, so we should type this. So this is gonna just create the place where we're gonna hard code our data for now. You can of course fetch this data from a REST API or from a database or any third party API. But for now, we're gonna hard code the data. So this is why we have this models directory. So we have a models directory created for this microservice and we add the hard coded information. So in this case, we're just creating a list with these objects. And by looking at the fields of this object, you know that this would correspond to the user type in, as we specified in our type defs. So specifically, this is the user entity. All right, so we have a list of users in our model section. Next, we'll define our user resolver by first creating the user resolver file from the root of the user API directory. Type the following. Now we're gonna load out the resolvers. So let's go to the root directory again and make a directory for our resolvers. So we have resolvers in GraphQL as well, but we don't have the resolve reference function like this. Like this is an Apollo Federation thing. That's like the jargon Apollo Federation uses. But in, a, in Apollo GraphQL, you would still have a resolver like this one, where you resolve the query and you specify what the user will return. So in this case, it will just be a user. So let's open resolvers index and add this to the definition. So let's look at what this file is doing. So this is our file for the resolvers. So we have so we're importing the user data. So this will be a list of users from models. Next, we define our resolvers. So we're also exporting. So this is what we'll export. So when anyone uses this resolver file, they will get this section. And this is our resolver for the query. So if you have a query, which is query, and then it's querying for user, it will get this thing, which is basically just a user. So this resolves the user queries by ID. And in this case, we have an asynchronous resolver. So we have async parent. So this function signature, or specifically the arguments that are being taken in here, are actually the exact same thing that you have in GraphQL. So the very first thing is essentially the previous layer in this case would be like the whole query and it doesn't make too much sense in like the root level which we are at now but later on if you use this first field it's always like the previous level the second thing will just be the arguments passed in in the query itself so in the query we're going to be passing in a field called id so we're just getting that value you can include two other fields after this and they would be for context so that's if you want user information maybe their user id or database information basically things that are context related that would be a field you could include here uh, so if you have context over here that's fine 
And you can also have info. So these are just the normal fields you would have in GraphQL, but you don't necessarily need to specify this. Okay, so we have the resolver and this has a user and asynchronously it'll take a parent and ID. And we're not using the parent here, so I'm just gonna do this. We then have user by ID. So this will look at users, so the list of users, and it'll find a user where the user ID equals the ID we passed in in our query. So it'll get you a user that matches that ID, and then it just returns that single user. So this makes sense. So the, the first query makes sense. Then we have the resolve for the user. So for a user, you want to have a reference resolver because it's an entity. And this is used by services querying the user data. So resolver for user queries by wallet ID. This has the resolve reference function. This is an Apollo Federation thing. You need to have this if you create an entity. And you take in a reference. So this reference will be a user. Over here, we're getting the wallet ID from the user. And from our users list, we're going to look at each user. And if the user wallet ID matches the wallet ID in the reference, then we will return that user. So going back to the schema, the primary key was wallet ID, which is why we had that search based on wallet ID in the second resolver. So these are our resolvers. Let's move on. From the root of the user API directory, you should now be able to sort the GraphQL playground and query a user by ID. So npm run start. Okay, so let's go to the user API uh, subdirectory. It's over here. And then they want us to run npm run start. So I'm gonna go to my package json and this is the command that's going to be run okay it says the server is ready and this is our server so i can write a query here let me test it out so let's go to our actually we don't even need to look into that so the beauty of the playground is that there's the schema over here and docs so i know exactly how to write a query but let me write an example query over here. And okay, how do we use this? Let's, okay, these are the possible queries we can ask for. So there's user over here, and then you just specify user ID to get a user. So let me query for the user. And then in the parentheses, I specify an ID and this can be Okay, this has to be an ID. Let me look at our data really quickly just to make sure I query for a correct user that already exists. Okay, let's query for one. And this user has ID, username, and wallet ID fields. Let's say I just want the ID for now. And let's get the username. I think that would be a good starting point. So let's look at our result. So the response from the server was the ID and then the username. We can include the wallet ID if we want to as well. And this will give us the wallet ID. All right, so we've tested out our query. Let's go back to the tutorial. Yeah, so their next step was basically just test out the query. And they've written out the query, I guess, in a cleaner manner or in a manner that would potentially be used by... Um, so they've used, they've used variables, which is, I guess, a nicer way to do this. So this is their query. User by ID. So they specify an ID variable. And the ID variable is this. So we need to go to the query variables box and paste this. So I can just take this, paste it here. And for the ID field, so this ID variable, it'll use this value. Okay, so that's 
the query and they specified a name for their query so they've called their query get user you can call this anything you want to i will call it hi all right um we have our id our id is one it's interesting how they didn't use quotes over here but i guess it's fine and then we have user id which will use the id variable and get the id and username so this will give me the same result of course without the wallet id field okay let's go back to our tutorial okay so we've received details and we can stop the service as we'll be running it in a different way later so i can kill it next wallet service okay so we're doing i think a similar thing but in a different service so we have the user api next we have the wallet api and first they say to install all dependencies so let's see the into that directory and install all the dependencies as listed in here Next we install Apollo Server and Apollo Federation, so we want those libraries. Next we open the wallet API index file in your editor, which will be used as the entry point into this service and add the following server definition. All right, so we copy paste this into the wallet API index file. So let's go to wallet API index file and it's pasted. The only difference is the port number and it's port 5002 instead of 5001 because we want our microservices to be on different ports. Next, we create our wallet schema by doing this. So we create a schema directory and create an index file in that. And over here, we now open this and add the following schema definition. All right, so let's copy this into our file. So again, this is very similar to GraphQL, but we have entities and let's look into these entities. So we're in the wallet API and because of that, we have the user type because we're going to be using that user type so we have the user entity which we've extended we specify the primary key and we're only going to mention the wallet id and specify that it's an externally defined field and it's a string so this is so that we can use user as a type in the following definitions so now we have asset balance this has amount and value then we have a crypto current so crypto asset which has a currency and balance and then a wallet type, which has a user, a wallet ID, and assets, which are crypto assets. And then we have a query. So you can query for get wallets, which will give you a list of all the wallets. And you can query for get wallet by ID. So you specify a wallet ID and you get a wallet. So that's nice. Let's move on. So then we'll create some example user wallet data. So from the roof of, sorry, from the root of wallet API directory, we're gonna basically put this in here and this is gonna create our model. So we're gonna hard code data into this. So let's put our hard coded data in here for demo purposes, of course, maybe in if this was like a proper project, you probably would be fetching data from an API or a database. But for now, we're hard coding our wallet's data, which is a list of these things. And these things are wallet ID and assets. I believe this is just a wallet. So if you go back to our schema, we see that type wallet matches our model index data so these are exactly the same but there's no user field so we'll see how we deal with that in the tutorial and of course think if you think about it that kind of makes sense right so the 
user data is going to be gotten from like the user API because they're managing that data, they own it. So this is what it looks like for now. Okay, finally, let's create the wallet resolver file. From the root of the wallet API directory, we create the resolvers. So we cd upper level and create an index file for resolvers again. And over here, we will just copy paste the resolver code for the wallet microservice. And looking into this, we're going to be importing our wallet data. We then define a query resolver for get wallets and get wallet by ID because that's how we specified the query over here. We then have these asynchronous resolvers for get wallets, which will just return the entire list of wallets from models. And get wallet by ID will make you specify a wallet ID as a argument in the query. And once you get that value, we look at wallets, so the list of wallets, and we find a wallet whose wallet ID equals the wallet ID provided in the query. So we then get the wallet by ID and then we just return that wallet. All right, uh, this resolver. So what does this resolver do? Remember that the wallet had a user attribute. So to resolve user data, we need to have this section in here. So as the comment says, our wallet contains a user entity extended from the user service and our data doesn't have that user field. To resolve user data, we send a wallet ID reference to find the owner of the wallet. So this user reference will have a wallet passed in here and from a wallet, you will get a user. So you have const wallet ID reference. So this gets the wallet ID from the wallet and then we're returning a user here. So we specify the type name as user because this is the externally defined type that we extended. And we then have the wallet ID because this is the primary key of the user. And so the resolver for this will ask the user subgraph for the user information. So this will go to user API to their resolver and it'll go into resolve reference to figure out the specific user that matches the wallet ID. So this is basically returning a user over here, which will then be used in the wallet API resolver. Okay, so we have our user and that's the only resolver we need. This is just for us to be able to figure out how to get the user field. Next, from the root of the wallet API directory, you should now be able to start the GraphQL playground and query all wallets. Okay, so we can start our service, making sure we've saved everything. And clearly I have not saved because you see the dots. But yes, I've saved now. And let me start the API. And this is specifically for the wallet API directory. So let me cd upper level and start this. So once it's started, the port number has changed to 5002, which is what we expect because it's a different service, right? The previous one was 5001. And let's create a query for our service. So query all wallets. Let's write our own query. So let's go to the, okay, we don't need to go to our service, right? We just go to the playground. We write our query and look at the schema and docs. So the query can have get wallets or get wallet by ID. Let's go back get wallets for now. And this is going to take in a list of, sorry, no, it takes in no arguments, but it's going to return a list of wallets. 
So let's make this give us. So it's going to give us a list of wallets, but then what wallet fields do we want? Let's say we just want the wallet ID and user. So let's specify wallet ID, user, and just for the heck of it, actually, let's specify assets. So it's going to give us every single field for get wallet. And at the same time, let's honestly just query for get wallet by ID. So get wallet by ID is going to take in a wallet ID. Let's make a variable for it, call it ID and well, actually, sorry, the field is called ID. So we're going to make a variable for it and call that field ID. And because of that, we're going to need to specify that in our operation name and header. So let's specify that this is a query. And we're going to call this query my query. And of course, we're going to specify that we need an ID field. And this would be of type ID. So I can specify the ID in the query variables. So this is going to be, so I'm specifying this ID. So ID, uh, so wallet ID is an ID. It's a non-nullable ID. So I can actually, I think I can do something like this just have a string in here and one or even without the string maybe let's try it yeah that's not right so field user of type user must have a selection of subfields right okay so i made a mistake in the query itself so i'm specifying user over here i need to specify which subfields i want so user is, okay, what fields does a user have? Let's try and remember, because it's not on the service, right? Let's actually go back and look at the user data really quick. Okay, it has a username, which we can use. Let's specify username. Username, why is it not auto-completing? I guess because it's not in the service, is that why? Probably, yeah, I guess so. Okay, um, can I create field username on type user? Does user not have a username? Actually, let's go to the schema. It should have a username, but it doesn't show up. That's interesting. But it makes sense because from a wallet perspective, they don't really care about the username, I guess. So over here, they just want from the wallet service. Remember when we specified our type? So if you go into schema, the way we wrote out user, this doesn't have that additional field. So it looks like we can't query it, which is interesting. So we can only query wallet ID. Even though username is a field in the user service. So if I do this, right, okay, assets is an issue because assets also has other fields. So I'm going to remove it for now. Next, field get wallet by ID must have a selection of subfields. Did you mean get. Right, I did actually mean that. So let me return the specific wallet i want actually let me just on the id oh, yeah. wallet id so unknown argument id on field get wallet by id of type query get wallet by id takes in a wallet id which is an id a non-nullable id i guess no it takes in an id and returns a wallet and I'm getting the wallet ID. This should be okay. Unknown argument ID. Is it not called ID? It's called wallet ID. That's why. Yeah. So let's change this to wallet ID. 
Yes, and finally we have... Oh, uh, not necessarily. Okay, this is wrong. But we have the get wallets working correctly. The wallet ID isn't working as, cor as correctly. It's probably because my variables are not properly defined. Of course, I mean, there is no wallet with this ID. I need a wallet ID that's actually valid. So let's copy this. And that fixes it. So we get wallet ID over here. And so we've debugged our query. And it's really easy to do so because like the schema and docs in the playground are right here. But yeah, we have a working query. Let's look at the query the tutorial provided. But I was writing the query that was just to verify our understanding. But let's look at their query. So this is their query. And this returns an array of all wallets. So let's get rid of my query. Put their query in here. Remove the variables because they don't use these. So they're getting all wallets and they're getting assets and they're specifying that they want the amount and value of the balance of the asset. And they also want a currency. So if I run that, this is the value. So I get all the information I need. Let's move on. Yeah, so this returns an array of all wallets. You may have noticed that our schema has given this service the ability to query a wallet owner's information via the user type, but as the wallet service is only available to resolve data about wallets and the user service is no longer running, we'll leave it up to our gateway. Okay, which we'll define next to bring our services together. And let's move on. So we'll stop the service. Let's stop it. Now, before we move on, let's take a moment to reflect on what we've achieved so far. We have implemented two services that allow us to have a true separation of concerns with the user's service defining the user schema and how user data is resolved for this service and all other services implementing user data and likewise for the wallet service. Now that our services are working and returning data, we can create our gateway to bring all of our service under, services under one roof and query them all from a single endpoint. All right, so the gateway. From the root directory, slash Apollo Federation starter, install the following dependencies by running npm run install. So let's cd out of this. cd out of services, so we're here. We're gonna install all the dependencies that are specified in, I think it's, the package JSON, so these dependencies. Set npm. Oh, hang on. npm run install. So now we're going to set up the gateway. And the gateway requires you to run npm install. Do not run npm run install, this is a typo. So we npm install to get all the dependencies. And then we install these libraries. So this is one command and we install these four libraries. I've already done this, so I'm going to skip to the next step. We then open the Apollo Federation starter gateway file in your editor, which will be used as the entry point into the gateway. And we add the following server definition. Okay, so this is something that would probably be different from like normal GraphQL. So let's go to gateway.js because I believe that's the file that they want us to edit. And let's look at this. So we have a Apollo server and GQL like we have in normal GraphQL. Then we have Apollo Gateway. This is new, so we're importing this from Apollo Gateway. And it's interesting because like they just take care of the gateway logic for us mostly. So that's nice. Then we have a port number. So we set the port to 4000 so it doesn't conflict with the other microservice ports. We then have this asynchronous function, which creates a gateway. And the input is an array of services. And specifically, the service list is just the user API and the wallets API. Okay, so it's interesting. The name doesn't need to match the file name. That's interesting. But the URL is super important. This is extremely important. This has to be on the right port. And specifically, the URL just needs to be right. 
of course I guess in production this won't be on localhost this will be an actual URL maybe on a different domain as well so I guess you need to make sure that that's set next we pass the Apollo gateway to the Apollo server constructor okay this is different so here we're passing the gateway but it's still the same function that you use when you create a normal Apollo GraphQL setup you just pass in the gateway which is nice okay disable subscriptions okay subscription subscriptions are not supported by Apollo server so this is a GraphQL thing I guess it's not as important for this case but what we're doing is just disabling it so that's fine then we have server.listen we specify the port in this case it's 4000 and we then start up the server all right so that's npm run start services and if we go to our package JSON, we should see a start services command. And this is the command. Concurrently, npm start service, and it starts all the services. And we should have all our services up and running. Okay, so this exited with code zero the cryptocurrency api is not up and running because we've not put the code down for that yet so that's fine we have the wallet api and user api that's up and running though so we move on so we started the services so we need to start the gateway in the new terminal window the gateway is coming up after the services have been started so npm run start gateway Let's run that in a separate terminal. So we have the gateway started. No, we don't. We have an issue. Cannot find GraphQL validation rules. No argument name rule. All right, so we had an issue with our gateway and I spent a few minutes debugging this myself and I found the issue, but to save you time, I'm gonna just paste a screenshot of the way I fixed it instead of you walking through and watching five minutes of me debugging something. The issue was that the version of GraphQL was not, uh, was not compatible with the version of Apollo Federation and the same applied to the version of Apollo. So I changed the version number of Apollo, so line 24 on the screenshot and line 28 on the screenshot is what helped me fix the issue. I also added a post install on line 12 to remove the node module um, GraphQL file and that was another suggestion that I found online but the most important fix and the fix that actually worked was lines 28 and lines 24 which is just making sure that we have the right and most importantly the, the compatible version of apollo and graphql that work with apollo federation we're starting the gateway it says it's ready so we go here and now let me make a query so let's go here and continue so we should be able to query so we want to make like a query to query something from any endpoint so let's let's actually make our own query and potentially combine things it should work i believe so let's go here let's write a query and we want to query okay so we, let's go to the schema. We can do these. So look at this composed schema. This is actually a combination of the schemas created earlier. So this is really nice. Uh, we have a combination or basically a composed schema because this user thing was part of the user subgraph and then these get wallets were part of the wallet subgraph. 
or the wallet API. So we can query for any of these things. So let's query for user. I need to specify an ID. So this is something from like the user query, the user endpoint. I specify an ID. Let's. So this ID has to be of type id so i'm going to put a default value in which i think i can do if i specify it right so let's make a query called my query and the arguments i'm going to take in is let's take in a variable for the id and this is going to be of type id and let's make the default value of this as an ID. Uh, let's make it one. I think that's a valid ID, but that ID will be used here. So we'll use this field. So we have a user ID. And so we then will get a user from this. And we would want to specify that we want only the username in this case, just for an example. And we can also query for get wallets. So let's get all the wallets. And we want to have, so we're gonna have a list of wallets and each wallet has assets, user and wallet ID. Let's just query for all the wallet IDs for now. So it's a very simple query and it works. So we have the user, the username, and then get wallets, and each of the wallet IDs. And if I were to get, for get wallets, if I want wallet ID and the user, but for the fields of the user, let's say I want all of this. So I want ID, I want username, I want wallet ID. And what does this give me? It gives me an error. Ooh. And why is that? Variable ID. Oh, right. Okay, so it's erroring because I'm not using this variable, although I specified it. So I can fix this by removing this variable over here. And hopefully this runs now. And it does. So we get our user and we get all the fields. So get wallets can get the user and any field in the user because the gateway is the thing that understands those directives and the gateway is the thing that does that linking. Okay, so let's go back to the tutorial and with the tutorial, they just gave us example queries and we've already tried this out. So I'm going to skip over it. And that brings us to the end of our demo. So we've implemented a federated graph. So hopefully that helps. Thanks for watching.